Welcome to the Happy Dog, Happy Human podcast, where we explore the intersection between human mental health and our relationships with dogs. We hope you enjoy today's episode. Hi, I'm Sharon. I am a human dog bond facilitator and therapeutic interaction strategist. I am the founder of Human Canine Collaborative, through which I support humans and dogs through trauma recovery, grief journeying, and professional practices of trauma-informed care by cultivating skills for somatic consent and nervous system regulation. I am also a licensed occupational therapist in California and hold a doctorate in occupational therapy with advanced clinical practice in community-based mental health. I have over 15 years experience working as a certified professional dog trainer and canine behavior consultant, specializing in public safety and dog bite prevention, animal assisted activities with special populations and rehabilitation for anxious, reactive and traumatized dogs. Hi, I'm Angela, the CEO of Cloud Doodles. We are a company that raises awareness about the benefits of dogs on mental health. We sell meaningful dog and human accessories to support our platform and to be able to give 25% of our profits to animal, dog, and mental health related charities. All of our patterns have a special mental health meaning and are designed and hand drawn by me. I believe that every human and dog should be privy to the unconditional love they provide for each other. I hold a BA in studio arts and a master's of social work. I am a licensed clinical social worker in the state of California, where I specialized in homelessness and severe mental illness. I currently reside in Italy with my poodle mix duchess, my husband, and toddler. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Happy Dog, Happy Human podcast. This is Sharon. And this is Angela. And welcome to our show. Awesome. So before we jump into our conversation, which is today is on dog depression, Angela, do you have any Cloud Doodles updates? Well, um, we always kind of have updates around the beginning slash end of months um, because I view them as my transition periods, uh, totally imposed on myself. But (laughs) um, the most exciting update is actually that we turn one today. Um, thank you I (laughs) felt more excited about today than my own birthday um (laughs) so yeah that's just a really exciting um I you know mark I think the first year like the first year of any anything's life is um fulfilling and scary and uh exciting and just like kind of crazy to reflect back on um everything we've accomplished this year and then also so much more to come so that's mainly what's on my mind right now um other than that we'll be moving into some fun spring themed things uh in march um so stay tuned follow us on instagram to get all the latest updates nice that's really exciting thank you and what about you sharon Well, I just updated a co-regulation with dogs digital workbook. I had originally written it over the summer, and so I just updated it, um, added some new information, and added an additional experiential exercise that you can do with your dog. So the workbook is an introduction to what co-regulation is, and then some activities to help you build awareness of your nervous system and some breathing exercises that you can do on your own and one that you can do with your dog. So you can download this on my website. Just go to hc-collab slash classes, and it will be uh, right there for you to download. So I'm really excited. Sounds great. Thanks. And um, I'm also going to be on someone else's podcast coming up in March, the Rescue Dog Love podcast with host Yamini. (laughs) Um, had me on last night to record to talk about muggins and um, my relationship with them and how I have developed um, co-regulation coaching. Um, So that's coming out on either March 12th or March 19th. So I will update you on the exact date um, on my Instagram when that is available. 
that's super exciting mm-hmm. got lots going on yeah um and a uh, little plug in for for Sharon too, but uh, her Instagram has just been blowing up, and I think it's because of all the amazing, introspective, and interesting contents going on there. So go check it out, uh, the holistic dog expert, mm-hmm. um, and uh, get involved in all the the interesting conversations. Yeah, thanks for that plug, Angela. It's been You're a welcome. wild ride. I'm really um, excited for all the new collaborators who are joining me. And um, actually, there was one more update I did want to give for uh, this particular month, and it might actually go into the following month. But um, as you know, uh, our Cloud Doodles uh, merchandise and accessories, 25% of the profits goes to a monthly charity each month. Mm -hmm. I do want to say that for the month of March, it will be going to um, a charity called House of Cats Ernesto's, Mm -hmm. which is um, in Syria. And um, they're an amazing organization that was already established, um, providing sanctuary for cats and other animals too, dogs and farm animals. And they have just been doing the most incredible rescue missions during um, mm-hmm. during this time uh, after the earthquake. And um, I really want to raise like good money for them. They've been saving donkeys on the side of the road, providing veterinary assistance going into rubble um saving you know cats and dogs and and bringing them to their sanctuary so i just wanted to plug that for this month um Mm -hmm. you know we want to do whatever we can to help uh with what's going on in that side of the world so just wanted Mm -hmm. to also add that to my updates yeah i'm so glad that you talked about that and um and are raising awareness and money to send to them so that's such an important cause yeah, definitely. We can't forget about the pets and the animals too. So <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. All right. Um, is that it for your updates also? Um, yes, I guess um, the other thing would be just that our Happy Dog, Happy Human subscription is up and running. So if you haven't checked it out yet, then head on over to Spotify and check it out. We have a care tip library Um, which is all of our care tips are edited out into quick um, videos that you can uh, watch anytime you need to. And um, there are afterthoughts conversations, which are mini conversations that are kind of reflections on our podcast conversations and um, just more in-depth exploration into our favorite topics. And it's just $4.99 a month. So go ahead and check it out and support our show. Absolutely. Yeah, we hope you like it. Uh, It's just nice to have sometimes this content um, at the tip of your fingers, uh, especially with the care tip library, instead of fumbling through the episodes of, oh, wait, which one was that care tip with the breathing that I want to do? So we just wanted to make that easily accessible for for you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of care tips, (laughs) we can move into our care tip for this Mm -hmm. episode. Um, and this care tip is actually inspired by my daughter. (laughs) Um, I, uh, recognize the importance of learning breath work at a young age, and it is something that I have been trying to teach her as well. Um, and so we're going to do three breaths, um, in the adult world, we are going to call this the pursed lip um breathing exercise in the toddler world we can call it blow out the candle nice. uh, or blow out the ban- the dandelion <laughs> oh, yeah. nice that's really fun yeah so um so what we're gonna do is uh get into a um comfortable seated position or you can lay if you're laying down that's fine as well mm-hmm. um And we are going to inhale through our nose and then we're going to exhale through our mouths with a pursed lip um, for the first time. Um, And then the second time we're going to blow out a candle and the third time we're going to uh, blow out a dandelion or blow the dandelion. I don't know if you'd be blowing it out anywhere, but (laughs) blowing the seeds out. (laughs) Yeah, blowing the seeds out. Sure. (laughs) It sounds a little aggressive, but that's okay. (laughs) um okay so and of course all three of these are really the same motion with your mouth um, for the exhale 
Cool. So let us begin with inhaling through our nose. And through a pursed mouth. Exhale. And now we're going to imagine our birthday candle. And we're going to hold our finger up to our mouth and breathe in through our nose. And blow out the candle. And make a wish. <laughs> and now we're going to hold our dandelion mm -hmm. and we're going to breathe in through our nose and blow the seeds softly that's it that was really fun i love that yeah, it's really fun. And I, the purpose is uh, really to slow down our breathing as we exhale. Um, and um, it is something that I, I've kind of enjoyed doing it in this playful way, because it helps me um, like also take it lightly, right? Like we're doing bright breathing exercises, but it can be fun. It can be light. It can help us feel lighter, uh, mm -hmm. you know, after doing it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That combination of like breath and playfulness is really cool. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and it really does work. My two and a half year old loves it. She does it exactly. Um, like, I, I mean, I think a lot of people probably would think, oh, can a toddler do that? I absolutely can. Um, and it's awesome. You know, if you do have kids to be doing this breath work with them from an early age, uh, so that they can, um, use these coping skills throughout their life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so important to teach them concrete strategies so that they can learn, you know, how to help themselves. Exactly. And we can also do that with dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So getting into our conversation today on dog depression, um, you might be asking yourself, can dogs have depression? And like, what would cause that? And, and what would it look like? And I think that they can have depression and there is actual research that supports that as well. And, um, and I think there are some, uh, quite a few similarities to uh, how and why depression might exist in dogs. The similarities um, are similar to how and why it exists in people. Um, on that note, I, one of the things I was, you know, I did, a, I, I did a lot of googling earlier on this topic because I didn't know much about it so I wanted to have some information mm -hmm. um and one of the things I came across uh was um that a uh uh scientist named Dr. Gregory Burns mm -hmm. um did research on about 100 dogs to see mm -hmm. he did MRIs on them to see if their brains lit up in the same places as humans when feeling certain emotions and he found that they did so there is concrete evidence um showing that dog brains their emotional brains are activated in very in the same way as human um, emotional brains so i thought that was really interesting wow yeah so like the part of the brain that we associate with emotions is the limbic system. Uh, and then of course the amygdala, which is the, the fear structure. And so if we have the same structures and, um, and those structures are performing similar functions than the experience of the animal um, and how they feel, it might be the same, or we can assume in an educated way that there is a similarity going on there. Um, I think one of the things that interests me in thinking about dog depression, though, and also just looking it up, is something we talked about last week with humans, for example, is that it it can be like a, you know, the nature versus nurture thing. And I think what we talked about depression was in the context of a mood disorder. Yeah. Um, and also meaning that, you know, it's like you you don't feel like you're yourself and you're sort of being taken over by by somebody else and this can happen randomly 
and then it's not necessarily caused by something that we may know of mm. um or that's so clear um so i'm wondering if it's similar for dogs like if they can have this like depressive sort of I, well i guess it's two things like can they have this like pr- depressive personality that we were talking about in humans or and slash and can they actually experience like the clinical depression that we talk about when we're talking about humans Mm, that's such a great question well in terms of personality I feel like there are you're right there's a nature versus nurture like there are some innate components to a person's personality and a dog's personality and then the experiences that the dog has throughout their life are also going to contribute to their personality and I feel like I've definitely known dogs that are more serious and Mm. um you know, like maybe less social, more withdrawn or more independent in some way. Um, And I'm not sure, like, we don't know what the dog is thinking about, like if they're more pessimistic or, you know, kind of seeing everything in more of a gray cloud kind of way, or if they're, um, you know, just like more serious and reserved. And, And it's hard to say, like, was the dog always that way? Or or did something happen that has contributed to that? Um, and could something change that would produce a change in what their overall personality or outlook toward life looks like? I think that's an interesting component that you're talking about also is that this like awareness, is that something that's reserved for humans where we have this sort of ability to because of our executive functioning do we have this ability to like see the world in a certain abstract way like we have this abstract thinking capabilities and even think about ourselves in an abstract way so like we talked about feelings of worthlessness last week like can a dog also like have that concept of feeling worthless Mm. um I mean I don't I'm not we're not gonna have answers for this today but it is something like more on a philosophical level um, when we're thinking about things like human depression symptoms versus, you know, dog depression where yes, like there are notable behavioral changes, which I want, uh, I'll ask you like, what, what Mm -hmm. are those behavioral changes? Um, So it's obvious that we can see a shift in, in how a dog may be feeling and they have an emotional landscape and that could potentially include more negative feelings like de- like depression and sadness and numbness and all those things that we described last week but like can it go as far as being this sort of clinical thing where they have abstract thinking about uh, the world being negative and the, their past being negative and their future being negative mm-hmm. if that mm-hmm. makes sense <laughs> yeah I love that you're asking this I think I've read a lot of stuff about people will say things like dogs don't think like we do, like they can't, they don't think abstractly or they don't, um, their behavior is not based on thought, you know, it's more based on instinct or feeling. But in my experiences with dogs, I can see that a dog has thought about something that is not right in front of them. You know, like Muggins will ask to go outside and then they'll walk a certain direction toward a specific destination Um, like we go to this firehouse that's about a mile from our house and there's a baseball field behind it and a lot of people bring their dogs there and we will meet up with friends and play and Muggins will walk straight there intent on meeting up with a dog to play with you know so it's like they are thinking about that ahead of time and they have a plan um, and the dog is not right in front of them and I haven't reminded them of the dog you know they're just like this thought pops into their head I'm gonna play with my friend and I have to go there to do it and they do it you know and even if there's no friend there sometimes we'll start to walk home and then Muggins will ask to go a different way where we've met other friends before you know so like they're really like have this intention and this thought about it and so I think that dogs have thoughts and intentions and I think they, they don't necessarily think in words like we do. But I also think that we can't really know what a dog Mm -hmm. is thinking. So to disregard the possibility of thought just because we can't measure it, 
I think that um, does a disservice to dogs in general. Yeah, I'm really glad you you bring that up um, because yes, of course, like I think there's always going to be a misconception with dogs. Well, I mean, humans like to put themselves above other animals, right? And so above other humans too, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is, a, I'm going to go on a tangent because I always do, but <laughs> did you know that, I don't know why, I, I think I went down to like a Google rabbit hole one night, but did you know that in the past, they actually believed that women's brains were they had the capacity of a child's brain that's like oh, actually yeah. what people that's what they thought yeah so they thought women were children yeah, it's <laughs> essentially <really fucked up. laughs> it is yeah. but it's it's just you know it's interesting thinking like that and then now how we think about animals and we're learning so much more about them in general mm-hmm. yeah. and um like we are very like egocentric as a species that we think um the like our way of thinking is the best way of thinking right you know yeah because there are different ways of thinking and like what I'm describing is an awareness of the self mm-hmm. I think that you know that I'm that we don't I don't know how to describe it even it's an awareness of the self that we we have that we are able to put into language very well Mm-hmm. not everybody yeah. we try to <laughs> right right yeah um, yeah there's um there's scientific research on this I don't know if you've ever heard of the mirror test where they will put um they've done this I believe with human infants and they've done this with several other species as well where they'll put uh, some paint on the face of the individual oh, and then yes. put them in front of a mirror and see if they try to check out the paint on themselves or whether they're only interested in on the mirror so if the individual is like touching the the paint spot or on themselves then it indicates that they are aware that something's different about themselves so it indicates awareness of self and originally when they did this with dogs they did not pass the test so people were saying oh then they don't have awareness of self but then a researcher named Alexandra Horowitz modified the test to use smell instead of vision So what they did was expose the dogs to their own scent initially and and saw how much time they would spend smelling it. And then they exposed them to their own scent with a modification and they would see how long the dog would spend smelling it. And they would spend more time smelling their own smell when it had a modification, indicating that they could tell that it was them, but there was something different about it. So they can demonstrate that they have awareness of who they are but not visually like we do because they're not yes, primarily visual species. so you mean when I spritz lavender on Duchess she, she knows it's not her yep exactly <laughs> I'm confusing her it depends whether she likes it or not I guess <laughs> I mean maybe she finds it calming but you know what was interesting before you even said the thing about smell I the first thing that popped into my head um with Duchess my my ex my dog example of my life is um if I put something on her that she doesn't like mm-hmm. she you can tell that there is sh- like vulnerability oh, wow. or like shame or a thought like I swear she thinks she looks ridiculous like I can I can see that she's thinking that uh-huh. that she's like why is this thing on me like why is this hat on me and it's not with everything that I put on her or like you know she's my my fashion model so it's only certain like textures or fabrics or huh. things on her head she's not into mm, um interesting but she gives me this look like what what is this? Like, I don't, this is not me. Like, get this off me. <laughs> you right? know? Wow. So it makes me think like, she clearly, of course, is aware of like some sort of um, like physical changes that mm-hmm. is making her appearance different. Right. Yeah. That's so interesting. Like it, um, cause it could also be the texture, like you said, of the item, right. but I feel like I've seen, like, I used to work at a facility that where there was a grooming um, department and I've seen dogs come out of there like with a haircut and they behave the way you're describing where it's like 
but again, there's a feeling difference as well as a visual difference. Right. So we don't really know, but right. it would see the dogs would seem to be like, they don't like their haircut. <laughs> yeah, no. And I've heard other people say this before. So I, you know, it's definitely something that like people notice that mm -hmm. dogs do behave that way sometimes. Yeah. Um, Fascinating. But uh, looping it back to the depression thing, um, you know, we started sort of talking about like, again, like there's no doubt in our in my mind also that they feel that they can feel depression. Um, mm -hmm. And like, what does that look like? Why, why do we think that? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're asking. Besides the MRI imaging. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Well, there you has know? also been... Um, some studies that are not humane at all, but they exist, um, in which they test or sort of produce learned helplessness in dogs. Um, the studies were horrible. It, they used like putting the dog in a room with the, where the floor could um, shock them and then not letting them escape, like not giving them a way out Yikes. and then having other dogs where they did have a way out and then seeing like oh what's the difference there um so obviously the dogs who were shocked and didn't <laughs> have a way out would learn that they they couldn't do anything to change their situation so they would stop trying to get away um so they learned it sounds like sleep public. training babies oh my god what it sounds like sorry I'm good I just brought up a very controversial topic but it sounds like sleep training babies oh where you're like not giving where them you a leave way your out. baby to cry mm. yeah this like helplessness yeah you wow. don't respond right there's nothing you can do so just yeah cry it out or just stop crying I guess is what right the goal is that's the goal yeah yeah that's, that's really interesting um anyway. yeah so we have to think about that <laughs> like what we're doing and what we're teaching when the um the being that we're that is the learner you know may or may not have skills or um tools to be able to help themselves and then they can learn that there is nothing to do or nothing I can do um so we know that dogs can achieve that state given certain environmental conditions and we know that helplessness is a component of depression sometimes you know or mm, hopelessness I guess helplessness and hopelessness aren't exactly the same thing but there's an overlap I think and I think um one of the things that it, it ties I don't know if it to me it ties a little more closely with like grief where if a dog goes through some a sudden major change in their life whether mm -hmm. it's like losing um their owner or losing a sibling a pet sibling human sibling whatever mm -hmm. or moving houses like things like that um that that can the stress from that can lead to depression and mm -hmm. more like depression depressive behaviors rather than like anxious behaviors mm -hmm. um, because there is a difference between the two so mm -hmm. you know maybe more like socially withdrawn whereas they weren't before mm -hmm. um or um like not playful they don't want to play and they were playful before like things yeah. like that yeah um like a numbness sort of like we see in in humans as well mm -hmm. uh, yeah that yeah. makes me think of um a short story written by alice walker and um, alice walker is a black woman author if if you don't know and it is black women's history week actually this week between february 25th and march 4th um, so anyways, Alice Walker wrote this great short story called Am I Blue? And it's about her experiences with a horse who belonged to her neighbor. And she describes how the horse um, had was lonely initially and how she like developed sort of a friendship with the horse by feeding the horse apples. And then the horse was given a mate for a period of time. And so, but then after they made it, the, the mate was taken away. And then, so she describes that blue, um, just like completely changed. And it was, Alice was mostly talking about the grief experience, but there was a definite change in the sociability of the horse. Um, and she described this crazed look in the, in the horse's eyes, um, that they were, that there was just such a difference in, it seemed like how the horse was just perceiving life. At that time, mm -hmm. so horses and dogs are different, obviously, but I just think that 
that story speaks to um, the depth of the emotional experience that animals can have. Well, I think it speaks to what we were talking about before. Like, can they have suddenly like a perception of life that's colored in such a way that's very dark and that's different from the way that maybe they view life usually? Um, yeah. Again, we can't really know the answer, but I think that that speaks to it mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, and it's also like uh, what I hear too is that there was something taken away from this horse and then there's this like feeling of emptiness, which also mm -hmm. goes hand in hand with feeling depressed. And it's like, there's just something missing. Yeah. Especially when it's companionship that's missing. Yeah. Right. And that loneliness. Yeah. And they're a social creature. I mean, us too, right? Like that's, mm -hmm. uh, that makes sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, you were speaking to how a significant experience um, like that, like a significant loss can trigger a depressive state. Um, and I have experienced that with dogs as well. I worked with this dog named Stu a long time ago. And Stu had been initially was rescued off the streets and then um, had a bad experience where he ended up being injured and then bit the person who was trying to put a leash on him to take him to the vet. Um, and the bite was pretty bad. So animal control ended up getting involved and the dog was impounded at the shelter. And then there was, um, there was a court case that came up. And so the dog was kept at the shelter. Um, they, I think they had, De deemed the dog to be dangerous I guess they had evaluated him to be dangerous and were going to euthanize him but then the court case mandated that because the dog was evidence he had to be kept alive so he ended up being in the shelter for a couple of years and eventually was transferred to the facility where I was working um, but because his behavior was so unsafe at that point um, we couldn't uh, put him with other dogs and we couldn't really handle him or touch him in any way so he was kind of just going through his days like going outside to go to the bathroom and and eating and then that's it you know just kind of spending the rest of the time in the kennel um so he seemed to have a real like an anger um to him you know and like a grumpiness and kind of like a lack of placefulness I would say mm -hmm. But we ended up um, getting authorization from animal control to work with him to try to improve this. And then we collaborated with the their veterinarian and ended up putting him on um, fluxetine, which is Prozac and it's a, oh. a SSRI. And we did that in conjunction with behavioral modification. And um, there was a huge improvement in him. That's really amazing also talking about, I mean, Prozac is like the antidepressant of the <laughs> 1990s, was it, I think? Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's it's interesting that that's the drug that was given to him and that there was like significant improvement because again, like that shows that there may have been a um, chemical component that was contributing to his feeling of depression or behavior that seemed like depression and um just like in a human, you would give an SSRI with some therapy, which is also behavioral modification in its own way. Yeah. Um, and you see improvement. So it's, it's uh, like, it also circles back to the, that uh, MRI research that our brains um, respond similarly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seemed like the Prozac, um, it allowed us to go further with the training. Like it opened something up in Stu that allowed him to feel, it seemed like he was more relaxed and mm. um, he was more social and um, definitely more playful. But I think also, I mean, there were things that we were doing specifically to change his daily routine and to give him more social contact and choices. So I think all of that kind of went together um, but I definitely think the medication was a key piece. Well, yeah. And I can imagine again, like we're social creatures. If you're putting a human or a dog in sort of a solitary confinement situation, mm -hmm. that also leads to a whole host of mental health problems. So like if you start adding in um, 
you know, uh, socialization or playing, like then you find joy in things again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And just like having choice, like being able to say, I want to do that and then get to do it. That um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. Because then you are helpless, hopeless. Mm -hmm. all of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think it's also interesting what you were saying with the, what we're talking about, like playfulness and with depression with humans and dogs, it seems like there is a, uh, something that can happen is a lack of pleasure in activities that you usually have pleasure in. And it sounds like with dogs that helping them sort of find pleasure in it or being playful again, so somewhat like humans, that that's sort of a way to help, um, come out of the depression mm -hmm. yeah I was just thinking about how like playfulness sort of involves a sense of curiosity and a also requires a sense of safety you know like you're really not going to feel playful if you're stressed or your basic needs aren't met and so I wonder if depression is sort of on the I'm thinking of it on the no side of the spectrum where like you're not saying yes to things because you don't feel safe doing them. But then if there is a sense of safety, then it's like, oh, I'm curious. Oh, I, I do feel playful. I feel like I can um, interact and try things. Whereas when I don't feel safe, I don't feel like I can interact and try things. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense also. Um, well, what are some other ways that like if dogs are showing signs of depression that you can help them kind of get out of it or um yeah help them feel happy um, again. Mm -hmm. well I was think talking a little bit about giving them choices so and that can look a lot of different ways it can look like asking them before you touch them um, so that they have a choice about whether they're touched or not or asking them before you put gear on them so that they have a choice of whether or not that happens um but it could also be like you're going for a walk and you could maybe pay attention to certain directions that your dog wants to go and allow them to choose which way you go, provided that it's safe, of course. Um, so there are a lot of ways that you can give them more choices in their daily routine. And then because dogs are olfactory animals, um, allowing them time to sniff or creating opportunities for them to engage in sniffing more often is hugely helpful because you're letting them like do what they're built to do, but you're also allowing them to have information about the environment. And because sniffing is related to breathing, you're also helping them engage in more deep breathing activities. That's really interesting. I know like with Duchess, I've always said that with her, whatever her sort of mental health um, reactivity issues are, like I always notice with sniff, sniffing makes it better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. So whether that's, I used to sit at uh, restaurants when she was younger and like the reactivity was worse mm -hmm. and I would just throw like crumbs of uh, treats everywhere. So she would spend yeah. the entire time like picking up the crumbs and it would take okay. a long time. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah. I love doing that. I do that a lot with muggins. I'll, we'll just go outside in our yard and I'll throw treats and they'll sniff around and find them. Yeah. Just things like that and, um, uh, is really helpful. But even like you said, like the sniffing, I mean, how I ended up having Duchess be able to meet people in a in a way that works for her mm -hmm. is 100% like her having the tr well first that she goes and sniffs them without anybody trying to pet her yeah so it's like her having yeah. the choice to go up to them to smell them mm -hmm. and then not be pet necessarily mm -hmm. unless she asks for it and it's she very directly asks for being pet or not like she will jump up on the person and oh, nice. kind of mm -hmm. uh, do the little stretch thing you know yeah but otherwise she just walks away oh nice yeah so like we want to allow dogs to get close because they like to get right up against things to sniff them but you don't want them to feel like if if you're going to get close to me that means you have to get touched also you know yeah exactly but anyway those are just examples of sniffing that I think have just been helpful in general for like Duchess's mental health 
period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I think also like when you're going for a walk, just making sure that if your dog wants to stop and sniff something that you allow them to do that, um, provided it's not like a chicken bone or something <laughs> gross that they're going to eat. <laughs> um, but just like really like letting them take that time because they need a lot of time to gather all the information. Um, and so if there is a situation in which you can use a longer leash, like maybe you're on a trail in the woods or at a park, um, using a longer leash gives your dog more freedom to go and investigate and sniff things that they want to sniff. And then another way to increase sniffing is like when your dog is showing interest in something, um, just like let them sniff it. Like if you come home from the store and you have a bag of stuff and your dog is curious, let them check it out and sniff it because that's how they're going to understand what it is. Or, you know, if like you're wearing a new pair of pants and your dog is curious, like let them sniff it. Or a, a really great way, um, if a dog is hesitant to go up to somebody else, like another dog or person, um, but you want to give them sniffing opportunity, you could take like a, um, like take your shoe off or your glove off or something, take something that smells like you and put it on the ground and let the dog come over and sniff it. It sounds like one of the things, I mean, also with, with, just helping them get out of a depression uh, is really just like creating opportunities for them to find pleasure mm -hmm. so whether it's through sniff sniffing or playing with you or social contact if that's what they want mm -hmm. uh, you know it sounds like even with the dog that you guys were working with that was deemed um unsafe Mm -hmm. uh that that's he sort of also got depressed because he didn't have oppor many opportunities to do things that that brought him pleasure and like yeah. once he once that was that gate was open for him and he felt safe like it helped him feel better also yeah yeah that's such a great point that like being able to enjoy things is really important for mental health and it, it was yeah. really interesting with Stu that like once we introduced things that were pleasurable, he also started to ask for them, you know, whereas before he wasn't asking for anything because it was like, there is nothing, you know. But right, which is like kind of what happens with people when they're depressed, like they withdraw and they, they're they not creating because of their depression. I mean, it becomes a vicious cycle where there's just not opportunity for um, for pleasure and things that they did enjoy. Mm -hmm. um and you know how do how do you find that again how do you find joy again yeah. um and maybe it has to be different things and you have to create different opportunities for different things um because of like what you're going through mm -hmm. but it's a similar I think it's a similar way out of that hole like how just how mm -hmm. do you find joy again how do you find pleasure again in the small yeah. things mm -hmm. yeah the small things and the sensory things too and like it sensory. doesn't have to be like you don't have to go out to like a party to find pleasure no, no. depressed like you can just like smell some lavender or like sip I was just thinking my like, cup of coffee tea. in the morning yeah <laughs> like the basics yeah. you know mm -hmm. exactly. smelling that's uh, that's even what I was I was you know I think with coffee I like the smell more than the actual taste and that's just yeah. more like a ritual of drinking it but I look forward to smelling my coffee in the morning mm, yeah that's such a great point smell is so tied <laughs> to how we feel yeah absolutely and obviously for dogs, that's like a big extra importance for them. So maybe that lavender spritz on Duchess is great for her. <laughs> <laughs> it's great for everybody. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things I did find also important, and I'm sure you were also going to mention this, but um, like with anything, this is also in humans, but with dogs too that if you notice any major behavioral changes and you think it might be mental health related, it's really important to rule out medical stuff first. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because they could be going through um, something that I saw, I'm blanking on the name of it already, but that happens in older dogs. Um, that oh, canine cognitive dysfunction. Right. So that happens in dogs over eight years old and um, the symptoms, it's basically, it's a form of, I guess, doggy dementia or Alzheimer's mm. or wow. um, just a, a brain degenerative brain disease that happens with age um, and their behavior might seem very similar to depression, but yeah. that's actually what's going on. And it's really important to always get a vet involved 
um, mm-hmm. just to rule out medical stuff. And again, it's the same for humans. I don't know if you ever read Brain on Fire. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Oh, it's a fantastic book, but it's about a girl. Um, it's her memoir that mm-hmm. I forgot what's actually what what actually turned out but they thought that she had schizophrenia but it what really turned out was that she had some sort of like infection in her brain and there was a swelling in her brain but the doctors kept saying no you have schizophrenia no you have bipolar no you have this but she really had a medical condition so it's basically a cautionary tale also Mm -hmm. I would say the same thing applies to dogs of Mm -hmm. you know it might look like something uh and basically like I would never just go ahead and diagnose myself my dog with such and such you want to rule out if there's um, a medical condition underneath it Mm -hmm. yeah especially pain like we know that when um, there is an underlying pain that uh, symptoms of anxiety can increase but it could also um, look like depression in dogs you know especially if there's an aggression um, behavior that's new or a lack of play or withdrawal from social activity, I feel like that could be definitely an indication of underlying pain that you want to get checked out first. Yeah, that's interesting too, you know, right, with with pain with dogs, because they, they show it in such a different way than humans. So mm-hmm. it's just not something that we're always aware of with them because they're really good at hiding it. Yeah. So it's important. It's important to just always check it out. It's just always get a vet involved mm-hmm. with any yeah. any major you know behavioral changes that you see in your dog or yourself yeah absolutely <laughs> get a vet involved they're nicer <laughs> <laughs> any, any i've never them. met a mean vet <laughs> right yeah that they're all they're all like so passionate about helping yeah mm-hmm. um yeah This has been a really great discussion. Do you feel ready to move into our aftercare tip? I definitely do. And I'm really excited for this uh, aftercare tip. So Mm -hmm. take it away. Okay. For today's aftercare tip, I'm going to teach you a sniff game that you can do that will help both you and your dog access playfulness and will support your dog in using their sense of smell. So you're going to need some supplies for this. You can collect empty toilet paper rolls or empty paper towel rolls and make sure you take all of the paper off of them once they're empty. And you're going to just take one at a time. So take one toilet paper roll and what you're going to do is fold in the ends. So if you need to see a video of this, you can watch on YouTube and you're going to fold in the ends just by like folding um, each side in down about like half an inch or so. And it doesn't need to be completely closed. It's okay if there's some gaps in it, but you want to like fold the ends in so that nothing can fall out of the end. And then you're going to put a treat inside. I recommend my friend Janet Lee's um, brand of treats called Care Canine. So shameless plug for Care Canine. These are really high quality treats and Muggins loves them. Uh, So check out carecanine.com if you have a chance. I'm gonna use um, the dehydrated uh, green lip muscle. And you just put that inside of the toilet paper roll and then you're going to fold in the other end. So you just fold in one side um, till it's like half closed and then you fold in the other side until it's all the way close. And now you have a little treat package. And so what you're going to do is hide this and let your dog sniff it out and find it. And then they can also rip apart and tear apart the cardboard. And so if your dog knows the cues sit and stay, then you can ask them to do that. And then you can walk away from them and hide this treat package. If they've never played a hide and seek game before, then don't make it very difficult. You can just put it down on the floor for the first time, even if it's in plain sight. And then you're going to tell your dog, okay, go find it. And then allow your dog to go and uh, find the treat package and rip it open and eat the treat inside. And if your dog does not know how to do sit and stay, 
then just have them stand in front of you. You can tell them wait and show them the palm of your hand and then place the treat package on the floor right behind you and then step out of the way and then tell your dog, okay, go find it. So it'll look something like this. I'll stand up and show you. Just rolling my desk chair out of the way. So let's say this desk chair is Muggins and I would tell Muggins, stay, show the palm of my hand. And then I'm gonna take this treat package, put it right behind me on the floor where Muggins can see it. And then I would say, okay, Muggins, go find it. And then Muggins will learn that word, find it. And they'll learn to wait for a second um, as you're placing it on the floor. And then as you repeat this, then you can gradually step further away from your dog after you tell them to stay. And you can gradually hide the treat packages in more difficult places. The easiest places to hide them uh, is obviously in plain sight and on the floor. And then it gets more challenging when you hide them out of sight. So maybe like behind, um, like I could hide it behind this bed right here that's in my office so that it's kind of like slightly under the bed. And then it gets more difficult once the treat packages uh, are moved up on top of things. So if I put it here on top of the bed, that would be more challenging. Or I could even eventually put it um, like maybe even on the windowsill if there's something that Muggins could climb onto to get the treat patch. So it becomes really um, a situation in which I have to be more creative to, to hide the treats in different places. And then Muggins has to be more creative and exploratory to go and find them. But I find that I really enjoy watching Muggins use their sense of smell. It's so amazing when I'll see them like walk past the treat and then all of a sudden turn because they caught the scent. Uh, and I'm like, how did they do that? How do they know? Um, but they're really good at it. And it's really fun for me. And I can see that Muggins, as they're like walking around trying to find the treats, they are wagging their tail and they seem to be having a really good time. So give that a try. I hope you really enjoy it. That's really awesome. I love it. I definitely want to try this. I do. I hide treats when I leave the house for Duchess because she suffers from separation anxiety, like when separation is happening not mm -hmm. after I know uh -huh. that she's totally chill which is but she makes it seem like I'm leaving her for the next hundred years oh but um this would be a really great thing for me to hide while um I'm leaving the house because then she becomes more interested in the treats themselves and then she probably has more to do and like forgets that I'm gone and then she calms down so nice. I definitely want to try this I think yeah. it's a good one for that that's such a great strategy. Um, I do want to add a disclaimer that if you're, if you don't know, or if you do know, if you know that your dog is prone to eating things that they tear apart <laughs> and they swallow it, then you want to supervise when you do this activity. But if you know that your dog is just going to rip apart the cardboard and then spit it out, then totally fine to leave them alone with it. I wanted to ask that also, because I definitely know some dogs that would just eat it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of them. So, yeah. <laughs> um but cool very very cool I uh will definitely try that um with Duchess um for when I'm for our separation anxiety coping skills <laughs> yeah yeah it could be interesting to set it up like before you start getting ready to leave to see yeah that. exactly so then she can kind of like have fun and you know do her thing yeah yeah cool great all right well that wraps up our uh uh-oh episode eight yeah <laughs> yes episode okay. eight okay <laughs> and that means we have two more episodes for season one um and it's going to be on um psychosis so mm -hmm. we'll talk about human psychosis next week and then doggy psychosis the week after yeah really bi-weekly i'm sorry every other week <laughs> that's right it seems like one week but it's two <laughs> cool so thanks for listening everybody hope you have a great day even though we are licensed professionals in our own field of work, Angela, LCSW, Sharon, OTD, and CDBC, this podcast is not intended to replace individual therapy for humans or behavior support for dogs. 
we approach our conversations from an exploratory, observational, and strictly personal lens. If you are struggling with your mental health, your dog's behavior, or if you or your dog have experienced a recent traumatic event, please see the resources section on our websites for a list of resources and places that can help. Visit either www.hc-collab.com slash happy dog, happy human, or www.clouddoodles.com slash happy dog, happy human. For additional show notes, including books and articles that we mentioned, please check out the footnotes section on our websites. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to support the show, go to buymeacoffee.com slash HDHH podcast and send us a few bucks so that we can stay awake and energized to make more content. This podcast is made possible by the collaboration between Cloud Doodles and Human Canine Collaborative. Check out our websites at www.clouddoodles.com or www.hc-collab.com. Special thanks to Tom Fox at Tom Fox Photos for support with editing and production consulting. You can find Tom at tomfoxphotos.com. Also special, special thanks to sound effects and story examples from Duchess and Muggins. We could not and would not ever want to do this without you.